to interject and, and say that I, I agree with you, uh, Rohina, that there is a larger scope of work to be done for the greater public. Uh, I have to say that uh, I'm, I'm going to go inside a little more and say, actually, the thing that excites me tremendously, particularly about working in theater and the medium of theater, is actually bringing it to my community. Uh, because theater, because sometimes they don't see themselves represented in these spaces so often it's kind of off the radar but the moment we start to have uh organizations like silk road rising like medina theater or or other organizations that will take the chance like 16th street theater for example in berwin uh i mean i i know we are very lucky that we live in chicago in the chicagoland area where you know throw a stone and you hit a, a you know storefront theater. Uh, but at the same time, it's important that communities rally around to use this medium as a form of not only trying to inform the, the West or the Western public, but also to help inform each other. Uh, an example of that is uh, I grew up in a family band and uh, my father's a musician and we grew up playing a lot of our own music and I learned a tremendous uh, amount about my culture through the music. But what really took me aback was um, I grew up in a Muslim household, but I discovered that uh, there were so many Christian Arabs. I played in Arab Christian churches almost on a weekly basis. Uh, later, I would also discover that there are uh, Arab Jews and uh, they listened to the same music that I was playing. Uh, I've even played with some of them. And in fact, I learned, for example, uh, in Iraq, half of the uh, orchestras and the musicians that were in these orchestras were of Jewish origin. They were they were Jewish, Jewish Iraqis. Uh, but my point being is that it, that's the part where the polyculturalism and the multiculturalism kind of intersect in some ways. Uh, our culture is so rich. And I say our culture, I mean, Middle Eastern culture, North African culture, South Asian culture, Southwest Asian culture. Uh, these cultures are not a monolith by any means. You go from one village to the next and things can differ. Uh, in Egypt alone, Cairo is its own entity. It's almost like saying Chicago is not Peoria. Chicago is not, you know, Olney, Illinois. If you don't know Olney, by the way, it's a beautiful little town, home of the white squirrel, <laughs> but it's not Chicago. And those same kinds of parallels also exist even in the micro communities that we have here. So what really excites me is the opportunity to not only try to create space now for my own community to do works for themselves so that they can also express themselves for themselves, not just for the general West, as you will. You know, I don't want it to seem that we're always trying to educate everybody else about our culture because I don't speak for everybody in my culture or the Muslim culture or the uh, I'm, my background is Palestinian or the Palestinian culture or Lebanese or, or any other culture for that matter. Uh, I think it's just important that we uh, find ways to humanize each other. And that's, I think, what theater does give us. Yeah, um, Rohina and Ronnie have eloquently said everything that I was going to say. And um, on Ronnie's last point, um, I think I, I, I started in this industry believing that I was a representative of my community because that was the outward pressure put on me by for being different. Um, and so in a lot of ways that limited my work and the older I get, the more I realize that I don't speak for everyone. And in fact, my biggest strengths are the things that make me really different from the rest of my community, right? It's like, at first it was all about Middle Eastern and North African representation. And then I realized that there was no queer representation within those communities. And so then that became my work. So um, I think the thing that excites me the most is the shifting, right? Of theater that just constantly happening and this evolving and that, yeah, we all are a part of a, Swanasa um, theater company, but even just the you know thirty of us have varying perspectives and lived experiences, and we can't categorize them even if we tried. Um, and I think it's more about uplifting that as opposed to educating non-community people about who we all are. And following up on that, what do you find is the most challenging 
in these polycultural stories to translate or convey to general audiences? Whoever <laughs> wants to go first may go first. <laughs> Can you ask that one more time, sure. David? What do you find is most challenging to translate or to convey to general audiences? I mean, I'll go back to my point and just say sure. that uh, it's that we are a varied group of people that though some of us may have uh, similar faiths or, or look similar to each other or not, for that matter, uh, we do come from different places. I, I know I spent a lot of time working on music from Kashmir, for example. And Kashmir is not India in many ways, though it might be under Indian control right now. It is not Indian culture. And if you go to India alone, you go to South India, North India, different parts of India, it's completely different. Uh, and the Middle East functions in a very similar way. Uh, if you go to parts of uh, North Africa, for example, uh, there are people who still speak Berber. They identify with being Berber or Amazigh or Kabili, despite the prevailing culture being Arabic or Arab centric. Uh, and though we share these regions, the, the diversity and the history that exists in each of them, it just, it, all of it merits so much representation. And I understand that there are all these differences, but could each of you pick a specific example of an issue or a story in some of these that audience members might not understand when they're watching a particular production because they um, can't relate to it. I haven't had that problem as a playwright oh. because um, I feel like, yes, you might be seeing a religion that's not the same as yours. You might be seeing an ethnicity that's different from yours, but the humanity makes everybody get understand what's going on on stage. So I've never had that problem with any of my plays where I've ever felt like the audience just doesn't get these people. It's it's never been um, my experience as a playwright um, where I felt like the audience does not understand what is going on here. Um, I don't know, uh, Martin, I don't know. Um, what what yeah, would you say? To, to piggyback off of that, I think for me, the challenge is to um, convey to people that our work shouldn't be assessed in a different way than any other work, right? It's like, we're all forced to explore and to kind of like represent our identities because that's one way of getting people to relate to us. But that obviously like shouldn't be the default, right? Like we don't wanna just talk about how we are Middle Eastern, we are just human beings who experience, you know, pain and um, love and joy in different ways that isn't just related to our identity. So I think the biggest challenge is to get people to understand that whether it be for the Jeff Committee or for critics, um, the work shouldn't be assessed differently, right? Like unless there is some some you know unforeseen thing that requires it to be that way but i think that you know that's it for me is that i and that's what equity to me means is like being on the same playing field but with that comes opportunities and without opportunities you can't be on the same playing field so it's kind of a balancing act i feel like i mean i know that one very specific example for me is uh being from where I'm from, my mom is from Jerusalem. My dad is from a town called Ramallah, which is the West Bank. And something that even people in my own community sometimes don't realize uh, is that in you know what is Israel, there are many Arabs and who are of Palestinian ancestry who are Arab. And they are on Israeli television. They speak Arabic, they sing in Arabic, they speak Hebrew, they sing in Hebrew. Uh, they're part of uh, Israeli theater. They're part of all of these kinds of, uh, of things. And that is their identity though, however, is very similar to my identity. And in trying to explain that, for example, with you know uh, a film like The Band's Visit, which became this uh, musical, uh, that film, half of the actors are of Palestinian origin. 
when when you go into the theater scene that is over there uh a lot of it is very middle eastern centric or southwest asian centric or palestinian centric because it's still represented there it's in it's in that kind of vein of being represented that has been something actually very difficult for me to try to convey sometimes to a lot of different people um because these places are very cosmopolitan they always have been just very much like america uh, and as Martin kind of addressed too, it's it's really important that we try to see when social issues become uh, where equity becomes a part of social issues, uh, and where we see uh, equanimity amongst these people. Then, like Martin just kind of mentioned, we see that things can be assessed uh, based on their merit, based on what is being presented, not necessarily who's being presented or why is it being presented. Well, the Jeff Awards members judge a wide range of a variety of plays. What suggestions do you have, even though you've just touched on this, for us as well as critics to improve our ability to adjudicate theater that reflects cultures and experiences different than our own? Uh, some people have an easy time doing this. Some people have a difficult time, critics also. What suggestions do you have I think the main one to me is that the Jeff Committee and theater critics need mm -hmm. to expand their roster of people to represent the global majority. I mean, the global majority is not white. And um, that's also for those of you who aren't familiar, that word sometimes gets interchanged for people of color because we are the global majority of people of color. And so I think that, that once that is reflected, then you don't have this, you know, people from the same lived experience all assessing a certain work that is not from their lived experience in a similar way, right? So that there, you don't, and I also believe that like to decide the merit of something based on your ability to relate is, is again subjective because like for me, so I, I've seen many, many plays of uh, and stories that are not my lived experience that I was very moved by and that I learned something new and that I left, you know, taking that knowledge with me and then researching it and learning about a community of people that I didn't know about. And just because I wasn't represented or the story wasn't about me and my experience doesn't mean that I couldn't relate to it. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that that's a big I agree. I agree exactly with what you're saying, Martin. I, I would love to see more diversity within critics, Jeff Committee. Um, it's very important. It's very important. And I think that's something that we are s slowly moving towards. And um, we need to see more of that. Uh, those that are, are on these committees, judging theater, should reflect Chicago. If we're going to judge Chicago theater, we sh they should reflect Chicago with its beautiful diversity. So I think that um, uh, I'm in full agreement with what Martin said. I would uh, concur as well. I, I, as, as someone who's been a grant reviewer, for example, one of the criteria that I have to look at is, you know, uh, especially in the past couple of years, uh, has been, you know, what is the diversity of the board and the administrative staff? regardless of the mission statement of perhaps, you know, the actual uh, organization itself. Uh, and it's kind of like what Martin said, it, it, it helps us to gain a better perspective. You know, that doesn't mean that, you know, an organization has to go out right now and make sure that it has, it, it checks its boxes for every ethnicity that there is. Uh, I mean, there is obviously something that's very important to, to look at when it comes to adjudication of, of uh, theater and, and, you know, all of the categories that we have, but, you know, widening that pool more and bringing on people that become more representative of the population that we are judging in some ways is, is a, a very, very important. So I think it really does need to start on the board level and it needs to start on at an administrative staff level as well. Speaking of diversity, what are you finding is the makeup of your audiences? Is it a wide range? Is it polycultural? Is it white? Is it Muslim? What's what do you see as your audience base and many of your productions? Well, I had um, said first that the thing that really excited me about when I was starting mm. my career and getting these plays up was the fact that we got a chance to um, 
educate folks who might not know the Muslim community. Mm. And um, the second thing that Ronnie talked about that I connect to is the fact that Muslims were coming to see my show and not just Muslims, Arab Christians were coming, just like mm. folks from our Swanasa region. And um, e even be beyond Swanasa, um, but definitely the Muslim community in Chicago, I can say are not big theater goers, but they were when my plays would go up. And mm. that would be great for my producers who'd be like, wow, this is a box office hit. Mm -hmm. And um, so producers are happy. I'm happy because my community showed us up. And um, that's really important because a lot of times they came to see my work with their fists up, ready to argue with me. Uh, my first play is called Unveiled and a lot of Muslim women came ready to fight with me, thinking that it's called Unveiled. So in other words, um, it's a play about take off your veil and be free. So they came in edgy, angry, thinking it's going to be something and then watching it and realizing it was something completely different than what they thought. And um, same thing even with Yasmina's necklace. A lot of folks came up to me and said, I came here really nervous, feeling uncomfortable because I'm so used to going out to see work about our community and being disappointed because it's stereotypical, racist, offensive. And even with my work, they thought it's gonna be the same thing. And they come in nervous, ready to argue in the post-show discussion and then discover that it's, it's not what they thought. So um, I think that's been something that's been really important is the fact that, um, first of all, it's just hard to get our work up. Most artistic directors year after year after year are looking to, when they have their season selections and those slots to fill, want to fill it with a variety of plays by white men to discuss different variations of white people problem. Mm -hmm. And um, there'll always be that one uh, play that might be African-American, maybe it's Asian. Um, and those playwrights of color often feel like the token and nobody wants to feel like a token. Mm -hmm. But season after season with most of our Lord theaters throughout the country, it's um, let's choose four or five plays with different white people problems. And so just getting my work up or getting work off Swanasa um, playwrights up is the first challenge. And um, one thing like that I had to do for the last 10 years when I was trying so hard to, to get these plays up was to say to those in that position of power, um, you're gonna bring a whole new audience. And, and I was always right because the shows would sell out. In fact, I can't tell you how many times. Oh, you're muted, Rovina. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, uh, so it was the good, the good man, you know, Yasmina's Necklace was one of the best selling shows in the Owen. Um, and, um, in New Jersey, one of my plays went up at premier stages and the artistic director told me, Rohina, your play broke box office records. Why? Because my community showed up and they showed up in huge numbers. So that's been really exciting. Yes, our community shows up. They want to see themselves reflected on stage. And um, that's been um, something that's been exciting, but we need a change in American theater with season selection, because I can't tell you how hard it is. The biggest victory out of all of this is just getting your work up. It's so incredibly hard. And now there's a movement, we see you white American theater. Thank God for that movement, where Lord theaters are now embarrassed, embarrassed for their year after year after year of white male playwrights, different variations of white people problem, they had to be embarrassed by this collection of artists of color who have said enough. We need to see season selections that um, represent our country. And thank God for those movements. Um, thank God for artists who start their own theater company. I mean, that was a big reason why I said, I, I've just got to start my own theater company because there's so many theaters who will not let us in. They will never let us in. We'll get to, we'll and get to, we'll get 
we'll get to that later, but, um, but yes, the Muslim community for sure shows up. Well, thank you. Now I have some specific questions for the artists. Uh, and Martin, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, your play, Leolina, was given a stage reading at the Goodman Theater. It will be presented in June at the Criminal Queerness Festival. This festival presents plays by L LBGTQ artists from countries that criminalize queer and trans people. How is the LBGTQ community addressed by theater artists in these countries? Yeah, so I had a hard time answering this question until yeah. I realized that I can't speak for all of these countries, obviously. I, um, I think that that's actually even a part of, so I, when, yeah. When my, uh, recently I had a conversation with the National Queer Theater um, who's doing a reading of my play this summer. And um, they are, or they have been a predominantly white institution and they do this festival where they pick plays from playwrights who are from countries that criminalize queerness. And so obviously that looks very different in every country. Right. Um, there is this misconception, I think, in the world of, you know, in, in our world that the the Swana region is extremely homophobic and uh, where queer people can't live there and they, so they must come to America to survive and to be free and to, and that's not everyone's experience, right? Like I immigrated here with my family as a young kid and so then, you know, my life shaped out to be the way it is, but there are giant queer communities all over the Middle East. There are people that exist and have been thriving. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of, yeah. So I, I don't think you can, I can give an answer that okay. is for every uh, country that criminalizes queerness. That also there's varying degrees. Like some countries are actually like, like lawfully illegal. And then some countries it's like frowned upon and then some other places it exists, but it's kind of a don't ask, don't tell situation. So I think it just depends on the community and the country that um, we're speaking of. And in this specific festival, we have, we're kind of, we have like Iraq, um, there's a playwright from Lebanon and there's a playwright from Mexico. So it's, you know, I think the conversation is different for each playwright and their play. Okay. Ronnie, your solo play, Ziryab, the songbird of Andalusia, traces ninth century Islam, Spain to present day. It weaves the past with the present, part biography, part autobiography. How has growing up as a Palestinian American on Chicago's South Side influenced this work as well as your artistry in general? Um, wow. Uh, well, I'll start by saying that, you know, I'm first generation uh, Palestinian American, and I was very fortunate that my dad was able to impart upon us, our culture upon us, through music, through the lens of music. Um, certainly, there was not any, there were no plays being written or, or films, really, that were showing this kind of thing. But how, how it really informed me was, uh, I had to try to piece the, put the pieces together. Something that really made me want to write this play is that I... Uh, I really adore Andalusian history and culture. Uh, you know, for for those who might not be familiar too, it's it's like for 750 years they spoke Arabic on the Iberian Peninsula. It was the lingua franca. I mean, that's that's older than America, uh, and to the point where kings and queens were you know engraving their tombstones with Arabic uh, in in Hebrew in some cases and in um, uh, Castilian and in, in variety. You know. These la this language was everywhere. It's why there are over 5,000 Arabic words in the Spanish language. Uh, but the thing that really took me th the most from this is that I, I saw a very cosmopolitan society that existed, that uh, it really shared in one culture, but from various backgrounds. And in doing, in doing the research on Andalusia for this period of history, I, I just, I couldn't help but think about Wow, this is very similar to how America is. This is the great experiment, right? And indeed, our new world that we know today really has a lot to do with what happened in the Iber on the Iberian Pen Peninsula up until 1492. Uh, just saying that year alone, all of a sudden, the conquest around the world gives us this new world that we're in. But it's very, very tied to North Africa, to the Southwest Asia, to the entire region. 
And um, when I pre presented it, because initially I, I wrote this story about Z Zidieb, the framing device was basically uh, this gentleman whose name is Zidieb in the eighth, he's a ninth century musician in Iraq, in Baghdad, during the Abbasid Caliphate of Islam. And he played an instrument that I play called Al Oud, which is the predecessor to the lute. Uh, and eventually the great, great grandfather of the guitar. Uh, already another connection to the Western world in many ways. So he takes this instrument all the way to Spain and uh, and it becomes this big thing. And that was my framing device. So when I first wrote it, it was actually at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. They wanted something for their green show. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to write this story. Uh, and and then I was approached by Jamil Khoury uh, at Silk Road Rising. He said, what are you working on? I said, I'm doing this. And I presented it thinking that it'll be done. He's like, okay, it's great, but can you put a little bit of yourself in it? I thought, myself? I, I All right, I guess so. And I just, I was trying to find, well, what is that common thread that I can put myself into this? And it was indeed my Americanness, being American, that cosmopolitan, polycultural outlook. But uh, then I thought, well, what of my history can I also put into this as well? And all I remembered was my grandmother. I interviewed my grandmother who born and raised, lived in Jerusalem uh, up until 48, uh, you know, after the war. And then she had to leave, flee to go to Ramallah. But she would tell me stories about growing up in Jerusalem, about the cosmopolitan air that was there. And, uh, you know, our neighbors in the buildings that we own there, right across the hall was a rabbi whose children called my my uh, my grand my grandparents, I guess, uh, Baba. His children, his children called my great grandfather Papa, basically. And my my point being is that that demonstrated such a cosmopolitan kind of uh, sphere that life. And I, I thought that's really kind of what in, informs me about how I see the world, uh, and how what informed that play specifically, is I wanted to create parallels that. You know, for so long, people, for example, through my grandmother would say things like uh, on her on her side, things like, you know, oh, those people, those people have been fighting for thousands of years. And I'm like, how is that possible? Here's a stretch of history for centuries where people live together. Here's a stretch of history for many, many, many years. People live together, uh, sharing in one culture. And then we look at America and I see the same thing. And, and those were the kind of values I wanted to kind of convey to omit this otherness, omit this kind of, I wanted to tell the omitted history of, of, of these peoples and this particular history of when we shared together. Thank you. Uh, Rohina, regarding your play Mecca Tales, could you please discuss some of the religious traditions that would help audiences have a deeper appreciation and understanding of these women's journey especially as we see the play again? Um, well, I think uh, my mother went on the Hajj pilgrimage. Um, she, something happened to her and she just kept going year after year and after year. She, she did five in a row. And, wow. and people don't do that normally. Mm -hmm. They do one and it's hard and they come back and say, I'm glad I got it done, you know, and my mom just kept going and going and going. And she'd come back every year with so many stories. And I just thought it was so interesting. And so when I wrote it, um, it was really fun to me because I thought, this is so great. Um, an audience is going to go to Mecca through my play, and they are going to see these women on pilgrimage, and they are going to see like spirituality and faith, and they're going to see... Um, parts of Islam that they normally never see that are beautiful and um, all because of the whole stereotype stuff. But more than that, they're going to see people be petty and talking about, um, I want a refund and I paid for the gold package and I paid for the platinum package and where's my air conditioned tent? I want a refund. You guys have cheated me, you chiseled me. And like my mom would tell me all these stories and I found them so funny and so human. And I think that was the biggest thing for me wasn't so much the ritual of the Hajj, but just the humanness of the women that I felt like was the most interesting thing for audiences um, to demystify the Muslim woman in her veil and just see them as regular folk. Can you, can you discuss the importance of the Hajj? 
um, it's one of the five pillars. So it's a big deal. And it's something that if you can afford to go, you have to go. Um, so it's only obligatory if you have the wealth and the health to do so. If you can't afford to go, it's not obligatory on you. But if you can afford it, you have to go at once in your lifetime. And a lot of people wait till they're older just because um, it's such a, a time where you have, you're in the desert and you have time to reflect on your life. So sometimes, you know, you can go when you're young, but your life is just beginning and it's like more meaningful when you're older and you have things to look back on and reflect on. And um, uh, it's just, it's such an incredible experience. I've been there myself and Another thing which I tried to show through the play was the diversity of the participants who go and you really see that diversity. You'll see, you know, delegations from Japan and um, from Russia and just everywhere on the globe, you will see a group of a delegation of folk. And that kind of diversity is really powerful and beautiful. And it's just, um, it's, it's something that, um, the places in my play are only, only Muslims are allowed in, in those religious sites. And so what was cool about the play was that I was able to take everybody, even folks who are not Muslim, to the Hajj through theater, through storytelling. And yes, it's metaphor, but um, it, was, it was really exciting. And there was this one moment where the women, they bury, they cut their hair at the end of the Hajj and they bury their hair. And it represented burying the old you because you're going to come home sort of reborn mm -hmm. and you're going to be a new person and a better person is that traditional or is that just part of your story that actually is traditional okay so um i was really interested in the idea of um burying the old you and so i found a way to incorporate that into the storyline of the play and i love that idea of the women cutting their hair and burying it in the sand. And it was exciting because that play, it had its world premiere at Chicago Dramatist, and then it went to New York. And in New York, the set designer said, we're building a sandbox because we mimed it in Chicago. We just mimed, the, the hair was mimed, everything was mimed. Um, but in New York and New Jersey, um, the set designer brought in a sandbox. There was real sand on stage and it was so cool to see that moment. And what was the coolest thing for me was how it resonated with people of all faiths or no faith. And there were really emotional and people were in tears and it was nice because um, I got emails about that. And one email in particular was somebody who was uh, previously incarcerated and um, the whole play, especially that moment at the end, resonated in such a profound way to that one particular person. Mm -hmm. And um, it just meant a lot to me. So it was an incredible experience. And I'm so grateful to Chicago Dramatists for producing it and letting me tell that story in Chicago. And um, uh, it was just a big blessing. And somebody sent me a, a quick question on the chat. Uh, do only women go to the Hajj? Oh, no. Yeah. Um, everybody goes. Everybody goes. Um, back to Martin. I remember seeing the play Human Terrain staged by Broken Nose in 2016. The play examines an anthropologist's efforts to interpret and de-escalate tensions between Iraqi locals and the U.S. combat troops. One critic praises its, quote, juicy moral conundrums. What should I know better to understand stories in plays such as this about What's going on there? Yeah, um, well, it's been a while since the play. Yeah, I understand. I honestly, you know, don't remember all the text, but I, I think that what this critic was speaking to was the main character, Mabry's kind of dilemma between prioritizing her job and the US military and the locals of the community in which she is deployed. Um, and so when it comes to that, I, to me, I don't see a conundrum. I mean, one thing is like, 
duty and job and rank and the other is like human beings who live in a place that you are sent to work and you know the character is also half white so there is this there's a scene between me and the main character in which I come on with like a suicide vest ready to blow up the place and the main character kind of talks me out of it and convinces me not to do it. Um, and you know, this this was my first play in Chicago as an actor, right? Like right out of college. So I, I wasn't, I didn't have the knowledge and the information that I do now. And so mm -hmm. while the actual production was really fun to work with because of Broken Nose Theater and Jennifer, the writer herself. But, you know, I, I think about that play a lot and I've even talked to some people from Broken Nose and I think about whether that play was, you know, the right time to be showing that mm -hmm. at the time, you know. I think to have a young, you know, Middle Eastern actor and I was, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I was the only Middle Eastern person in the show and, you know, as being portrayed as this terrorist and, I, I, you know, it's, there are some things that are based in truth and, and I understand that. And there's a story, you know, every story needs to be told if, if that writer thinks it needs to be told, but I wonder if that was the right story to be showcasing. And if those stories are the ones that we should be showcasing, obviously, I mean, I, I won't bring up names, but there, you know, there are other writers in our community that kind of go for this naturalistic, realistic, kind of like what's on the news stories and characters. And I understand that, that there is like truth to that, but I, I also want to challenge those people and say, what are we saying by making those the only depictions that we see, right? Like if, if Swana theater was just very varied and kind of, you know, was abundant, then that would be a different story. But I think when, when there are so few of our plays being done, it really matters what we choose to be done. So that was a really long answer to, to okay. your question. I'd like but... to follow up. You said that you know more now than you did then. If you don't mind my asking, can you give me an example of what you know now that you? Oh yeah. Well, I, I turn don't I turn those roles down now. I oh. don't do them. I don't. I don't like. My resume is not worth me depicting myself and my community in that way. I mean, obviously that like, I'm not saying that that's what every single Swanasa person should do. That's right. what I do. But at this point in my career, I have enough, I think enough theater companies and people trust me to, to know that like, if I reject something, it's not because I'm, you know, don't want to work or something, but yeah, I have, I have firm beliefs now that I didn't used to before that I am not, um, hesitant to express, I guess, just to get work. I have a follow-up question for everyone. As you know, Martin was in the play Human Terrain. One review states, quote, the delicacy, strength, and understanding that Silva gives to Adelia will open your eyes to what it means to be a Muslim woman. What does it mean to be a Muslim in 2021? Well, I'll let the Muslim people answer that. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, that for me, it's like I, I can throw the same question and say, what does it mean to be a Christian? Okay. What does it mean to be a Jew uh, a, or a Buddhist or a Hindu for that matter? And part of the reason I say that is because there are several sects of Islam. Mm -hmm. There are many different approaches to Islam, Sufi Islam, Shiite Islam, Sunni Islam, Alawi Islam, uh, Ismaili, Ahmadi. Uh, and I know that the same exists in Judaism because I've studied a lot of it. Uh, you know, we have everything from Kabbalah to Sephardic to Ashkenazi to Mizrahi to, and then the same thing uh, in Christianity. I never even knew that we had so many sects of Christianity just in the Middle East alone. It was that that blew my mind like wait wait when do you celebrate christmas uh but to get back to that i mean what does it mean to be muslim and it depends because what's happened since 9 11 especially is that anybody who had a muslim background just like anybody who might have had a christian background might not necessarily be the most practicing person but all of a sudden now we are thrust into this spotlight to have to either a represent everybody or make sure that, you know, the moment something happened overseas, they come to me, what do you think, what happened? I was like, 
I don't know what happened. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll follow it, but it's, it's much deeper than, than just that. Uh, what does it mean to me personally today, if I just answered from a personal level, Yes, is to dig deeper in understanding my faith and, and all of the aspects of that faith that I grew up in. Uh, and I've become a lot more aware also to the, what is orthodoxy into this faith and what this faith was on a historic level. So even if I wanted to call myself, and I don't, but even if I wanted to call myself a non-Muslim, I can't help but say that all of Islam informed my entire background, my entire culture, my entire language, everything that I, I do, for me personally, at least. Anyone else? Um, okay. um, for me, um, what does it mean to be a Muslim in 2021? Um, well, I can only speak for myself because we are so, like Ronnie said, such a diverse community mm. to be Muslim. I mean, it's so much diversity. There are folks who, who would say, I'm, I'm culturally Muslim. There are folks who would say, I'm very, pra I'm practicing. And some people who say, I'm not practicing. I mean, it's just so much diversity. So I, but I can speak for myself as a Muslim woman. Um, I don't know. I think for me, the pandemic, last year, March, 2020, um, was a real, for me, a uh, time for a lot of growth spiritually for me because I fell into a depression as soon as March hit and we were in, we were now home and um, the future was so uncertain. Um, I felt very blue. I didn't feel like myself at all. I remember not being able to write and I'd open the documents, I'd, I had play commissions, people were waiting for drafts and I couldn't write. And um, all my travel was canceled. I had a lot of upcoming travel, gigs canceled, um, worry about how am I gonna pay bills. And yet the thing that got me through that depression really was long walks and um, listening to lectures about um, Sufism, which is a part of Islam, and it deals with uh, um, real spiritual stuff, very deep, profound things. And I listened to a whole series about um, uh, a scholar, his name was Ibn Atta'Allah um, from Egypt, and he has these things called aphorisms, which are little short sentences that are wisdoms. And his aphorisms are so profound. That helped me get through my depression. That helped me grow so much spiritually because even though all those aphorisms were written 700 years ago, they resonated with right now. And um, I think I grew a lot in my understanding of Islam. And um, I changed a lot. I changed a lot in my way of thinking. And I... Um, I think that uh, one of the mus Muslim scholars who I, um, who was a, a mentor to me kept saying, there will be a silver lining. And I was feeling so depressed when he was saying that. I kept thinking, what silver lining? And with time, I saw that silver lining and I just, I grew tremendously in my own faith. So um, uh, I don't know if I've answered your question. But... Can you remember one of those aphorisms or I don't want to put you on the spot. There was one that really resonated, bury yourself in the land of obscurity, mm -hmm. for that which is not properly buried will not bear fruit. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why it resonated so deeply, maybe because we were now all at home and had to do a lot of self-reflection and felt in a way like a seed that was buried because before I was out there in public and working and productions and this city and that city, and now I was just home and it was just me, my husband and the kids. And um, yeah, um, thinking about maybe the fact that I'm at home is a sort of burying of myself. And, um, and because I'm buried, I'm going to grow. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I have grown tremendously from this whole um, quarantine, home, COVID. I have personally grown tremendously to the point that um, now a year later, 
I'm not depressed. I'm starting a theater company and that's amazing. Why don't you tell us now, but I have some more questions, but let's talk about that theater company now. Okay, um, well, you know, I talked about this a little bit before, but mm -hmm. there, it's frustrating, honestly. For me as an artist, when I was really trying to get theaters to let me in and really realizing they're not gonna let me in. And, you know, I hate to say it that way, but it, I have to be frank, most of these Lord theaters are run by white men or white women who want to do white people problems and they want to do about five or six plays that, that represent that. Um, things are changing. Theaters are embarrassed because of We See You White Theater, um, White American Theater. And that has embarrassed theaters so that now, finally, they may be doing a Muslim play. Finally. Did you have to be embarrassed to finally do it? I guess so. But more than that, what I realized is um, I can't wait for people who don't want to champion my community's playwrights. Like, I can't tell you, forget me. I got to a point where I realized um, I've got to help other playwrights who are amazing from my community and deserve productions. I'm going to try to help them. I'm going to have meetings. I'm going to talk to theaters. And you really realize the gatekeepers are not letting you in. They're not championing our Swanasa community's playwrights. And you, it was something inside me that said enough is enough. Mm -hmm. All these big theaters, at some point, all these big theaters were small, tiny storefronts, just like Medina Theater Collective is right now. And they grew with time. And so we need to just go back to the basics. We don't, what I realized was is we don't need to wait for other people to give us permission to celebrate our playwrights and tell our stories. We are going to do it ourselves. We're gonna get the work up. We're gonna work as a team. I'm gonna work with my community. And, um, and our community will be our audience and others will follow, but we're gonna make art for our community and they will show up and they will support us. And um, just a whole bunch of epiphanies and realizations that we need to do this. Um, oh, another thing, you know, I want to um, celebrate um, Middle Eastern or Southwest Asian playwrights. I want to celebrate uh, North African playwrights, South Asian playwrights. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that um, when it comes to certain plays, um, they get silenced. And I'll be very honest with you, you know, I have ha had 20 theaters collaborate with me, but I'm Pakistani. My mom was born in India, mm. I'm Muslim. But as a Pakistani South Asian, I don't get silenced. Mm. I can't say the same thing for Palestinian playwrights. And this is something that I'm not just making up for the fun of it. Mm. You can do your homework, you can do your research. I can send you an article written on this that productions that have been canceled because the playwright is Palestinian, mm -hmm. productions that have been pulled from seasons, productions in not just United States, but even England, um, United Kingdom, this has been happening. And I personally know playwrights who are Palestinian whose plays have been canceled. And they're, what was their crime? Because they're Palestinian and they don't want that narrative to be told. People in power might be the board members uh, putting pressure on artistic directors. But I'm so outraged by this because what I, what I hope everyone understands is that I don't believe anybody should be silenced. There might be a play by an Israeli playwright. I would not want that play canceled. It's the same thing. So why should Palestinian playwrights be canceled and silenced? So one of the aspects of Medina Theatre Collective that I'm passionate about, especially because I just got back, um, February, 2020, I was in Palestine and I saw with my own eyes. And once you see, you can't unsee. And so my theater also has a commitment to present plays by Palestinian playwrights. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to share with you, David, that in June, End of June, a Palestinian playwright born and raised in Gaza, Ahmed Masood, is flying to Chicago nice. and we are presenting his one woman play called The Shroud Maker. Mm. We're going to be doing two performances, one with Inter International Voices Project and right. one with the South Asian Institute. Mm. 
and um, he's flying to be a part of it. And he's going to be here for a week. People can meet him. I'm going to set up dinner so that other theater artists can meet him. And I'm so excited about it. And um, when I read this play, The Shroud Maker, I was just blown away by how beautiful it is. And my thing is like, nobody should be silenced. I would never silence anybody. Even if I disagree with their point of view, I would never silence them. So that's one thing. Um, my theater company is going to um, celebrate Swanasa playwrights. And I have an, a, a commitment to Palestinian playwrights. And I also have a commitment to plays that deal with human rights violations. I want to commission a play about the Uyghur genocide. Rani and I are figuring out a way to write a play about Kashmir because what's happening in Kashmir, people need to know. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another aspect of human rights violations that I want our theater company to um, bring awareness through storytelling and theater. Here's a question that uh, somebody sent on the chat. Uh, and it's for all three of you regarding the, uh, the company. Do you feel an obligation to portray your community in a positive light, given how rarely it is seen on stage at all? Ronnie or uh, Martin, do you want to comment on that? I mean, I would say I want to present them in a human light with their flaws, with their kindness. You know, I, I don't want to pander to this thing like, I need to be an apologist every time somebody decides to go do something crazy that represents the 0.1% of the billion, you know, people on this planet. Um, I, one thing that really excites me about this is something that I kind of fell into either as a playwright or as an actor. And that is to try to tell the omitted stories. I taught for a very long time, uh, down in Inglewood at the Lindblom math and science <laughs> as a part of, uh, um, the Arabic language initiative that they have down there. And I wanted to do the same thing, not just with my people, if, if you will, you know, in quotations, my people, but rather the African-American students, which were the predominant uh, demographic at the school, who had no idea about things like minstrelsy. Mm. I, I mean, to give you an example, we were doing a whole unit on, on that because it was with a choir class. And we were talking about the the Fisk Jubilee Singers. And this is not far off. This is just kind of to put things into comparison. Um, the choir director that I was working with went upstairs, came back down. He said, you'll never believe what I found. It was a yearbook from 1950. He opens up the yearbook. And there, right above in the library where these students were seated, right above there was a whole group of people in blackface. Now, to think that these students are sitting in the same institution and had no idea that that was a thing, that even minstrelsy was a thing, I felt incumbent upon myself to try to resurrect this omitted history to pass it on to them. And the same way I did with them is the same way I'd like to do it even with my own culture and my own people, if you will, uh, is to find space, agency, to let, this be, let these stories be told. Yeah, that's that. Ronnie just really spoke to what I was going to say. I completely agree, and I, I, I think that I'm at a point, uh, kind of along the same vein. I'm at a point where I want to challenge my community, right? Like I'm, I have no interest in like superiority and trying to assume this like we are amazing and we're only great and we only have things to celebrate right like we're, we're flawed we have problems and I want to challenge my community with my work but I want to do it in a way where I'm not afraid that a non swana person is going to see that and then be like oh see I was right that everyone is homophobic you know um so there's that like balancing you know that um that line and being able to do the work that we really want to do but we can't really do that right now with the current state of theater because like Rohina said, it's leading to violence and hate crimes. And yeah, so a little mix of what Rohina and Ronnie were. Some, somebody asked me to ask you a question. If you would take a role in a play like Disgraced, <laughs> you know that? <laughs> you, know, you don't have to answer that if you don't I'm want I'm wondering. Who asked and why? Okay. No problem. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'm I'm going to just step in and say one thing real quick. Sure. I admire Rohina because she did something that challenged her own community. 
Mm -hmm. And I was actually doing the author of Disgraced. I was sound designing one of his other plays once mm -hmm. at uh, a play um, at uh, VG, Victory Gardens. Mm -hmm. And I remember, Rohina, you came and, and you saw that and you just felt like there, there needs to be some kind of counter narrative to this. Uh, and, and you did. You stepped up and you, you challenged that. And I, I found a lot of admiration uh, I, uh, for that because... Here we were, you know, somebody was latching on to something that Martin was talking about before, the news stories. There, there's space for that. Yes, there is. I, I will say that. Whether I view it through informed eyes of saying that this person is just perpetuating the stereotype, no. uh, believe me, I've seen it in, in my own communities and everything. But to create a level playing field, to have the opportunity for somebody, for example, like Rohina to step in and say, can I do a play that counters this narrative right now? That to me is far more exciting than trying to just combat it. You know what? I'd rather put up. Right. Well said. Uh, one final question. Uh, we've talked about some specifics of theater. Now I have a general question. And it's one that we as Jeff committee members often wrestle with. And it's this. One of the goals of the Jeff Awards is to recognize excellence in theater. When you attend a production, what to you separates a production from being very good and one that's excellent? Hmm. Well, it's a tough one. We... I think ahead. about that sometimes. I think about like, what makes a production excellent? And for me, it's when all the components of theater come together. Number one, starting with the script. The script is solid. It makes you laugh. It moves you. There's something in it that moves you to your core. That for me, when I see a play that has that and also makes me laugh, um, something that makes me think about it a, a month afterwards, a, a year after it's five years, like it just stays with you. Yeah. That's to me a sign of an excellent play, but it's when all the components of theater come together perfectly. For example, the script, the director, the actors, the lighting, the sound design, the set, every single component is just comes together beautifully. That to me is when I've seen something that I would say excellence. Yeah, you know, um, before I guess, it, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it wasn't until I, I actually saw Anna Devere Smith at Arena Stage in Washington, DC, that I realized one person can capture the attention of so many people and deliver something that's the most important thing to deliver, and that is a story. And if that story set in the proper way, I didn't even need to see any set design behind her. I didn't need to see anything. And I know this is kind of a lofty way to look at things sometimes, but it, it is really about the story. And I say this from uh, my great grandfather was what we call a hakawati. In, in, in Middle Eastern or Arab tradition, that means he was a, a storyteller, musician, somebody who kind of plays and tells stories. And those stories are still here. Th those stories have still been, they, they were so profound in their components and in their elements. I think the one thing that shines through to really distinguish that which is excellent versus very good to me is its sincerity. If it's sincere in its delivery, if it's sincere in its storyline, and I don't see the pretentiousness in it, you can eliminate all of those other things. And that is what stands out for me. And Ronnie, you can have, I'm sorry, Martin, you can have the final word. Yeah, kind of combining what Rohina and Ronnie hmm. said, generally just goes back to if I learn something new and if I'm moved, like I think at its simplest way to describe it, like, and move doesn't only mean to tears, right? Like I could be moved to inspiration or to be motivated or, but if I, if I walk away feeling like I have a new perspective to draw on or to look into further um, and I was moved because I felt like what Ronnie said, it was genuine and um, then ultimately like, I'm gonna like that work. Yeah, most likely. Thank you. Uh, final word to those that are watching this tape. <laughs> As a reminder, the Jeff Awards holds regularly education programs and usually they're live, but because of the pandemic, uh, tonight's program was 
held virtually. And many of our previous programs are available for viewing. Just go to our website, jeffawards.org. And at this time, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank the three of you for not only sharing your time, but sharing yourself. I mean, these were not easy questions sometimes, and you had to open up, and that's always a risk and challenging, but you're theater artists, so you've been there. <laughs> so again, thank you very much, and we appreciate it, and all the best. And Rohina and Ronnie and Martin, you will keep us posted on this yes. June production. Excellent, excellent. Thank, very you, thank you so much, David. Thank you to thank everybody. Thank you, David. Thank Our pleasure. You. For having us. Thank Good you, everyone. Night. Good night. Good night. Okay.